going to mute everyone, the organizers if you can unmute yourself after I mute everyone. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'll get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our first grad school workshop. Um, this is all based is, um, if grad school is right for you. Um, I am Brianna Rodriguez, one of the peer mentors for the sociology department. And today we have Dr. Danico and Dr. Daniels here to that's going to be giving a presentation on imposter syndrome and just sharing a little bit about their experience with grad school and their research. And then along me, I also have um, other peer mentors, um, Danielle and um, Victoria here with us. And yeah, thank you all for coming today. Let's get started. So Dr. Danico, do you want to start off um, with your, or, and we'll both Dr. Daniels with presentation on imposter syndrome. Let's talk about that, that first. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. First of all, you know, I think what we wanted to talk about today is whether if grad school is right for you. And so I think when we were when Dr. The other Dr. D and I were talking about this very question, um, something that resonated for both of us was the notion of imposter syndrome. And I'm not sure if how many of you have heard of this and just in terms of like show of hands of folks who have heard of the concept of imposter syndrome, can you like raise your hand or do an emoji or a thumbs up? Okay, cool. I mean, even, you know, our former first lady, Michelle Obama talked about imposter syndrome and she too was a sociologist. How about that? Um, yeah, it's kind of cool. We're like, oh, cool women. <laughs> so um, as a first generation college, I never ever imagined that, you know, I could, ever pursue a piece, it wasn't even a, a, a thought. And actually as, a, um, as an immigrant, I immigrated to the United States when I was uh, six years old and I was just sharing with the other, you know, the co-hosts of this thing that I learned how to speak English watching old television shows, that I was often told that I was not good enough to even go into AP classes in high school or that my language or my writing or, you know, all these little nicks and crannies were in and so I think when you grow up that way with a parents who don't know how to navigate universities or college or even high school, and then you have teachers and people that you admire telling you that maybe, you know, you're not good enough, it kind of stays with you a little bit, right? Um, I think so for me, I was very fortunate that I had one teacher in high school who many students who work with me have heard, uh, his name was Mr. C. And he was the one lone uh, teacher who looked like Santa Claus, you know, and he was very, very sweet, who believed in me. And he really advocated for me. And I think he believed in me more than I believed in myself. And so I think, you know, throughout my whole undergrad, when I went to UC Davis as an undergrad, I always felt like I had to overperform because I was told that I wasn't good enough, right? So I worked, so many of you are working full time and going to school. I worked, you know, 20, 30 hours a week. Um, and I wanted to prove everyone wrong, so I graduated in three years and a quarter. Um, but I really didn't have a college experience um, at all because I was always working. I didn't go to any of these kinds of sessions or um, talk to people. And so I think it is that question of like, am I good enough? You know, do I belong here? And obviously, I've been a professor now for you know over 22 years, right? So it's clearly I do belong here. But even to this day, there are days that sometimes you wonder like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm a professor or, oh my gosh, like, ooh, did that come out right? Like you do question yourself and it's this tape recording that goes in your head that you're constantly always rewinding. And it has a lot to do with my own socialization process, right? And so that's one of the reasons why I do research on families and socializations and identity. And, you know, like the notions of mental health resonates very strongly for me because I think for a lot of women, especially, and then women of color, um, you know, we don't get mentored in the same way that men do. And I think those, all of these things combined together led me to kind of question myself. 
And so it's actually quite normal if you're all kind of raised your hand and said that you felt that way. It is something that we all do go through. And, um, and I'm going to pass it off to the other Dr. D. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Katie Daniels. Some of you may know me. Um, so this is my first year as a faculty member here at Cal Poly Pomona. I just finished my PhD in May. So this is very fresh for me, um, which means I can share a lot of information with you all because I remember it. Um, so just thinking about imposter syndrome, so like this idea that we are in a space where we don't feel like, I mean, that's definitely something that resonates with me and, and like Dr. Nico said, like even as a, as a professor, especially as this be my first year, you know, I still have those feelings. So just know that like, if you ever feel like you're an imposter in your space, like the people that you look up to that seem like they have everything under control, they, they get those feelings too. Um, so a lot of the things that Dr. Danico talked about really resonate with me as well. Um, I, I wasn't an immigrant, I was born here, but I am a first generation college student. Um, I grew up in a working class family and I, I wasn't ever like the smart kid. Like that wasn't who I was growing up. I remember testing um, for like the gate gifted and a talented education and I, I didn't test into it. And I remember like that to me being like this signal, like I'm not a smart kid. Like those are the smart kids. Like I'm not one of those people. Um, but I, I did enjoy school and I did well in high school. And so I went to UC Davis, just like Dr. Danico. Um, <laughs> and I mean, that was like a big thing for me, just going to college. My mom always taught me probably like a lot of your parents, like go to college, you will be able to get a job better than like what me and your dad had, like you'll be able to provide for your family in ways and have a career that you actually enjoy. And um, that's something my mom always told me that like education is your path to, to having those things. And so I really value the education. Um, but I was definitely, I was very shy in undergrad. Um, school gave me a lot of anxiety. I had a lot of imposter syndrome. I still had that tape in my head of I have to work harder than, I always said that, I have to work harder than everybody else to get the, I get good grades, but I work harder than everybody else um, because otherwise I wouldn't get these grades because I'm not as smart as everybody. Um, and so gave, school gave me a lot of anxiety. I also worked because that's how I could afford college. So um, I, I worked part-time throughout college. And so I, just like Dr. Danico, I did not have time to go to things like this. Like, I mean, props to all you for being here, especially if you have a lot on your plate, like I'm sure a lot of you all do. I never considered going to a PhD program. I always thought, you know, I want to get my master's one day. And that was what my goal was in undergrad. But I always was like, I'm not smart enough to get a PhD. And school gives me too much anxiety. Even if I could, like, that's just too much for me. Um, and so, again, I had all these things going on in my head. I took time off after getting my bachelor's. Um, I worked for three years before applying to PhD programs. And I feel like in that time is when I started to gain more confidence in my intelligence and in my ability to be able to take on something so um, difficult as a PhD program. And so definitely, I mean, that's, I'm all for taking time off. If you, you know, if you think that you need that before going into grad school, if that's something you want to do, because I feel like that helped me push back against that imposter syndrome to even take that step of being like, actually, I do want to get a PhD. I want a career as a professor. Like, that's where I want, that's what I want to do with my life. So I'll stop there, but we can talk about imposter syndrome more, I think. No, that's so interesting for me, because like, I took three years off too. And I, I think for me, I took three years off because I just need to make money. I mean, it was more about like, I was just tired of being poor, you know, and having and working all the time. And so I just wanted to make money. And then, you know, I, I worked for three years and I made a lot of money um, toward the end. Like when I was 24, this is crazy. By the time I was 24 at my peak, when I was a regional director of Nutrisystem, it was a weight loss company that's now brick and mortar, that was brick and mortar, but now it's all online. Um, I had like 1,500 employees when I left, and I was 24 years old when I left, and I made more than, I, I now just make as much as I did when I was 24. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. So I was making a lot of money, you know, for like, 
at that time for me, someone who didn't have money. Um, but I realized that wasn't for me. And um, the work sent me to a lot of leadership meetings and conferences because I oversaw so many folks. And it was at that leadership meeting where they asked me, what is your passion? And I think passion is not a great word because now I think more about like, what's your purpose? You know, what brings you joy? What brings you happiness? But at that time, I really thought about it. And it was the training and development part of my work that I loved the most. And so that's when I decided to go back to school. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that you and I both took three years off. Yeah. Mm. I don't know who's asking the next question. <laughs> So did you guys want, um, so like how was like the research for you like in grad school? Like, you know, I know grad school has a lot to do with mm -hmm. research and all. Mm -hmm. So how was that like? I mean, my experience with research was really great. Um, so I did my uh, PhD at UC Merced, which is actually where I grew up. So I grew up in the Merced area. Um, and I had really supportive faculty that, you know, there, I highly recommend UC Merced if any of you all are interested in sociology programs. Um, and if you want to get me to get you in touch with anyone, 100% reach out to me. Like I can help you figure out like if who you want to work with, um, get you in touch with any of them, introduce you to any of them, I would be happy to. Um, but I definitely, so UC Merced, their sociology program, the faculty there, it's a new program. I was the only second, I was the second cohort to ever exist in the PhD program there. Um, and so I went in in 2014. And so, I mean, for me, there was a lot of opportunities for to get onto faculty, um, different faculties research programs and collaborate with them. But that's, that's still something like they have a goal of making sure that their students have opportunities for research outside of just their dissertation. So no matter, and their master's thesis, like no matter what you are going to do research, so the first two years you're working on your master's thesis um, and then, you know, the rest of grad school, you're working on your dissertation and that's your research, right? You have your own research program, but then separate from that, you know, I got different faculty members that either a lot of times they'll in, like invited me to work on research projects with them um, or they said, you know, does anyone want to like they sent out and invite maybe to their class or just all of us grad students. Is anyone interested in working on this project? And so I got through grad school, you kind of start building up like different research projects. By the end, you're all like on all these different projects. But yeah, you have people, people would invite you and you'd get on their on their research projects, which is a really great learning experience and career development experience. Yeah, I think in terms of like even doing research and even getting people to invite you shows that, you know, Dr. D probably was a really strong student because I think one of the things that I learned and I'll talk about research in a second, but what I learned about the successful grad students are we're not always the smartest students, right? Like they're not the ones who had like four point GPAs in high schools. They weren't and at undergrad. The ones who successfully navigated and completed the PhD programs were the ones who had tenacity who are motivated, you have to be self-motivated, you have to have, you have to like be really focused because grad school kind of sucks, you know, at times. Um, I was very lucky, I had very supportive mentors, but I know a lot of other people, majority of the people um, really start to question themselves. And this goes back to that imposter syndrome part, like, am I smart enough? They're all these smart people, they have their masters already. You know, I don't have, like you start to question yourself. They make you read tons and tons of books. And so a lot of students at Cal Poly, um, right now, because of, for those of you in my class, because of COVID, I actually require less reading in my classes. Usually it's double what you're reading if we were face to face. And a lot of the times, you know, students tell me it's tough, but then afterwards they thank me when they're in grad school because you sometimes have to read a book in a week. I mean, it's like the process of grad, grad school is pretty grueling, but then you learn how to read very quickly. You learn- A book per week per class. Yeah, per class, yeah, per, <laughs> yeah. per class, yeah. And so you're taking like three, four classes, right? And then, and then in grad school, if you get a B, that's really bad, <laughs> you know? I mean, so the expectation is really high and they encourage people to show up, be present, ask questions. Um, and so, you know, grad school for me, because I took three years off and I was in corporate America and I was already leading people, 
was easy for me because my experience really helped me be able to multitask those things. Mm -hmm. um, compared to a lot of students who came straight, it was just like, oh my gosh, because it's also very political, right? You have, um, it's like any work environment. It's not just grad school. It's anywhere you go in, it's political. And so you have to have pretty high emotional intelligence, I think, to be able to be successful. Um, in terms of research, when I got there, I was originally kind of, it's kind of weird. They started to recruit me for different projects and I was almost like a criminologist. Um, I was a co-PI for the state of Hawaii. I went to University of Hawaii at Manoa and I did domestic violence evaluation of perpetrators and survivors of domestic violence. And so for, for two years, we did that research for the state of Hawaii, which was great because I got to travel to all the islands and interview survivors and perpetrators. Um, I also interviewed um, ICE or crystal meth users who were pregnant, you know, pregnant women with Mita Chesney Lynn, who's really like premier criminologist. So I was kind of being geared in that criminology track because at UH at the time had a really a lot of strong criminologists. Um, but I ended up doing research about, you know, 1.5 generation Korean Americans, which yielded my book. And I, be, I found mentors outside of my discipline. And so ethnic studies actually became more of my like intellectual home, even though I'm a sociologist. And I think that's the thing with grad school. Sometimes you can find you're lucky enough, like Dr. D and myself, to have people offer you opportunities. But there are other times that you can seek out mentorships and opportunities on your own, too. So it's it's a the research is different depending on who you work with, mm -hmm. but you got to start reading. I mean, that's the thing that I would encourage you. You got to, I don't know, you got to read. When you read, you become better writers. Just, um, and just get used to that girl. And I think of it as my job, like when I was in grad school, like school was my job. You know, I think you and I talked about that, right? We had the same feeling. Yeah. So, I mean, I had like bouncing off what Dr. Danico saying, like I took three years off after I got my bachelor's. Um, <clears throat> and so when I went into grad school, I had that same mentality, like, Grad school is not school. It is actually a job. That's what it is. And so your, your advisor is your boss and whatever your advisor says to do pretty much. I mean, you could push back as you progress in grad school a little bit. You can push back. You can have conversations with them, but they're your boss. Like you do what they say and you'll be good. Um, and so having that mentality really, I feel like helped me with grad. like you need to be in class. You need to go to the research talks when there's someone visiting, they have a visiting speaker, you go to the talks, you go to the events that the department has and do what your advisor says and you'll be good because you're looking at it like a job, I need to be present. It's not like school where it's just as long as I do well in this test or as long as I turn in this paper, I'm good. No, like you have to do all that plus all the other little things that your bosses ask you to do. It's so funny because I think it was in grad school like that I started to get more involved, right, and go to these talks and things like that, things I never did as an undergrad. But you are all ahead of us because neither one of us did these things when we we're undergrads. But it really does help you prepare for the culture of the academy. And I met some really great friends um, through that process. So really famous scholars who I became friends with because they, when they said, oh, this so-and-so sociologist coming to give a talk, can someone meet them at the airport? I'm like, I will, you know, like, and you just take these opportunities to pick them up. I had a sign, you know, pick them up and, and you talk to them. And one of them ended up um, becoming an external reviewer for my very first book. And it was so cool because he was so supportive. And I think you don't do these things because you want to get something out of it. I think I really genuinely wanted to learn from people who are way smarter than I am mm -hmm. and who really hopefully would mentor me in different kinds of ways. So I always sought out opportunities to connect with people, whether it's their research or the people themselves. Um, so yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's so interesting, like, cause it's, it's, we've talked before, like Dr. D and I've talked, but our trajectories are very similar, just different generation, right? Because, but it's very, very similar, yeah. Brianna, we're getting questions in the chat. Are we going to address those maybe at the end? Yes, I would like to address, yeah, all the questions you guys have, like, yeah, definitely keep them coming. We'll get to them um, just at the end. Um, um, right now for this question, uh, I'm really interested in wanting to know from us for mentors. Um, Cause you know, I understand that you guys take breaks and it's like normal to take a break um, after um, getting your bachelor's. Um, so if you want to take a break from school and attend grad school later in your life, 
what do you recommend to do about um, obtaining letters of recommendation when you decide to go this route? I mean, for me, even just like two or three years, it might feel like a lot of time for you all. As you get older, time, uh, it goes quicker, right? And so like for us as, as professors, when I have a, I remember my students <laughs> from years ago. So as long as like we had a good relationship, like even just like my students from my class that talked a lot and things like that, like it came to my office hours, I remember you. So, you know, reaching out isn't a big deal. I mean, in my opinion, I don't know what Dr. Danico thinks about that, but I reached out to professors that I had, you know, years ago and they, they remembered me and wrote me letters. It wasn't a problem. Yeah, I think it's about, you know, some students are very outgoing and some students are very shy and, and, um, and it, it can be kind of awkward, right? For, and so I get that too. I don't mind writing letters for students that I haven't met, that I haven't seen in years. Um, most of the students who I know want to go to grad school, they tell me now, like, I want to go to grad school, but I'm not sure if it's right now. They stay in touch with me. They'll like email me periodically or, you know, we have Facebook friends or whatever. There's some, some kind of connection. Um, because I've been teaching for so long, I've taught thousands of students. So I, it would be very, you know, um, dishonest of me to say I remember them all. But I definitely remember the ones who came and visited me, who who was active in my classes, and who talked to me because it 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 just makes it harder, right? So I think if you, I think it's about building relationships, and relationships is you know it has to be continuous. Doesn't mean you have to go out to eat together or drink coffee. It doesn't mean that. It's just kind of checking in one time. And I have students like that. Like I just want to let you know what I'm up to, and it's smart because then it helps me. I feel like I stay connected with them. Um, one anecdotal story, I had one student um, in my intro to sociology class who was a horrible student. <laughs> like he got, I think he barely passed. He got a D, maybe D minus in the class. And I remembered him because he was always, he came to class, um, barely, but he came to class. And I just noticed him because he always wore the same hat and I could tell he was sleeping. And so I would have to go by and wake him up. He emailed me, I think 10 years later, because I called him on it. I called him on him like, being asleep and just like, don't come if he's gonna sleep and you know, be, be attentive and be present. Um, and then he was. And so he emailed me 10 years later and said, I don't know if you remember me, but you know, I took your class and you know, really, like, really changed my life. And I, I remember like, yeah, he was like a D student, but he wrote me this beautiful letter. He wrote this letter about how he has transformed and his life, what he's done since he graduated and how he kind of turned himself around. and. Shared and then so I wrote him a letter of recommendation for graduate school and he got in he got into a very prestigious grad school in Korea and um, I still see him when I go to Korea, you know, we like we we connect. So I think it's about how do you present yourself, even if it's been years. Um, you can't just say hey I took your class can you write me a letter, you know, you want you want to kind of build that relationship. I mean, I think that's what I would recommend because Maybe Dr. D has better memory than I do, but um, there are students I know by face, but sometimes in a name only, I don't always remember. So it's good to maintain relationships. Yeah, it's definitely good to maintain relate. I mean, if it, I haven't had the experience of teaching for 10 years. I mean, now I've taught for like, this would be my seventh year of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there, I mean, there's definitely, after, after some time goes on, you know, you lose memory of people, but like Dr. Dean Nico saying like, if you sent us, like, tell us what you're doing right now, remind us who you are, um, what you did in our class, um, send us over like your resume so we can see like those kinds of details, that would help inform us to be like, okay, yeah, this is a good student. Um, they, these are the things that they're going on. I can talk about those things in my letter. Um, I mean, just anything like that is really helpful. Like sending over anything like that when you're asking for a letter is really, really useful. I think also grad school, it, it, there's different layers of grad school, right? So if you're applying for MSW programs or higher ed and education or PhD or MFT or law school or a public policy, there's so many different grad schools that you can apply for. And what you need to provide is different depending on the kind of program that you're going to be applying for. So I would encourage you to come to future 
of workshops that the social department and PMs are going to put forward because we're going to talk about the differences, right? Um, but I think re your relationship with your faculty or if you're going to do social work with your intern, um, you know, supervisor, your relationship with folks who can write letters or rec and who can speak on your behalf is really important. Um, I know that my students will often like message me information and I say like, okay, what class are you in and who are you? Because virtually, if we're face to face, I'll remember you. But because it's virtual, it's just harder for me to remember names. I'm horrible with names. Faces, I'm good. Names, I'm bad. And so it's just, it behooves you right now, especially during this remote learning, is to take the time to visit your professors, you know, in their office hours and, you know, get to know them and get, let them get to know you. You know, I think that's even more important than you getting to know us, is that we want, we want to get to know you because a walk on water letter looks very different from a good letter. You can, I can write a good letter, but it's not going to be a walk on water letter. And I'm more than happy to talk about that later. So looking at the chat, I know there was one that was um, asked by Christina about the prep for um, before grad school. So would you mind um, elaborating on how it was the process for graduate school and um, how you guys just navigated through everything? Like preparing for grad school, you're talking about, Daniela? Yeah, preparing for it. So I mean, right now, if you're interested in going to grad school and you're still you're still undergrads, like definitely prepare by doing well in your classes, building relationships with faculty members, um, like we were just talking about, and also getting research, some kind of research experience. Again, like I didn't want to go to grad school when I was undergrad, so I and I was working, so I didn't get research experience. Sometimes I'm like, how did I even get it? That's that imposter syndrome. Again, right? like, how did I? Why did they even accept me into grad school? Um, so I really didn't have research experience beyond being at a research, you know, doing my undergrad at a research university. So if you can fit in some kind of research experience, um, you should do that. I mean, I love the curriculum in our department at Cal Poly Pomona because we requ require you all to take an upper division methods course, which I mean that in itself, I feel like is really good experience and that's that's a good place to get experience. But if you can get experience beyond that, I mean, that's good. A lot of programs require the GRE, which is a standardized test. They're starting to not to. I mean, we, you know, especially. Davis is not requiring it this year. They're not a lot, especially this year because of the pandemic. But yeah. I, I think as things go on, they're yeah. not going. I feel like that's going to stop. But I mean, I had to take the GRE and I studied for that for like three months on my lunch hour because I was working full time. Um, because it's a weird test that it's, it's supposed to be only high school knowledge because not everybody got the same training in college, right? Like we're all different majors, but it like, they're, how the questions are formatted or they're just like nothing you've really had contact with. That's what my perception of it was. So you do need to study. If you do need to take the GRE, study for it. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Dr. Danico. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know where you're all at in terms of, you know, applying for grad school. So, you know, I think that if you are a junior, I would strongly encourage you to apply for the McNair Scholars Program. I think the McNair Scholars Program is a wonderful prep in terms of getting you ready for grad school. And, you know, um, and the benefit of that program is that when you're ready to apply for grad school, they pay for most of your application fees. It's, it's a competitive program. Not everyone gets in, but I would definitely encourage you to, you know, apply for that. Um, I was also looking at some of the chats in terms of like going back and, you know, how do you build relationships with professors and what do we recommend? You know how you meet people, there are people you connect with and other people you just don't. I mean, I think that's the same thing with professors, right? I think you have to be authentic. I don't think you want to like fake it. Um, one of my things, I don't like people who come and come to me to build a relationship because they want something out of me. Like it just feels kind of icky, right? Um, and it rarely happens, but sometimes it does. I really like students who generally want to like grow and learn. And I feel like I can support them, you know, that I can help elevate what, and that's why I run the peer mentoring program is because I want to help support and elevate student success. So I would encourage you, I think it was Karina who asked, is to like talk to different professors, get to know them. And someone was asking, so we just go into Zoom hours and meet people? Yeah, and see like, you know, talk about what you want to do. Um, 
you know, we do advising all this curriculum sheet stuff, but what we love to do is really to try to help you figure out, you know, how to move on to the next path, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, preparing for grad school, there is not one formula. It's different for everyone. I didn't prepare. You know, I worked, <laughs> I didn't. I worked um, for three years after. I gave a six months resignation thinking that I will have six months to study. That six months turned into an extended period of time because they couldn't find my replacement. And I had two months to study for the GRE, which I really just didn't have time to study. And it was the hardest test I've ever taken. I don't know about you. I thought it was just, it killed me. But somehow, um, it, you know, I scored enough to get into three schools and I end up going to the school that gave me full funding. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line is that I, again, even though I had a lot of money saved because I was making good money, I still came from a very working, you know, first gen student mentality that I didn't want to spend all that money that I saved. So um, I, when I went to grad school, I actually lived life like a regular person versus a starving student like I was an undergrad because I had all this money saved. So I got to go out to nice restaurants and all that stuff. And people would ask me like, how do you do that? Like you're a grad student, um, not knowing I had all these other things. So I think in preparing for grad school, um, you have to kind of find your own path. And I think if you, because for me to give a blanket answer would be, I don't think would be really as helpful, but I would definitely encourage you to um, talk to your, like talk to us, like Dr. Daniels just offered and uh, to introduce you to anyone at Merced. And many of us do know lots of people at different institutions. And so depending on what grad program you want to get into, then we can really talk to you about how to best prepare. So first thing is figure out what you think you want to do. And then second is find not just one. You can have, you, you're not cheating on us if you see other people. So find a lot of faculty members that you connect with, right? It doesn't have to be just one. Okay, we had another question in the chat um, from Cynthia. What advice do you have for first generation students who want to go to grad school but feel intimidated? Um, Dr. Daniels, did you want to start? Yeah, I mean, my, my advice definitely, well, first of all, come talk to us, like, come to our office hours and say, you know, I want to go to grad school. Do you want to tell me about your experience? We love to talk. People love to talk about themselves. So that's always a good thing to ask somebody like, will you talk about your experiences as a first generation student? I mean, it's a good way to like start building a relationship with a faculty member here at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, in terms of like selecting a program, if you are a first generation student, come from a working class background, um, are a student of color, like my biggest advice, a woman, um, my biggest advice is look for programs that want to support historically underrepresented students. Mm -hmm. So try to find the programs, the people that that is one of their goals. And look at, you know, you could start applying to programs when, if you get into grad programs, they usually invite you to go visit the university. Like they pay for you to go, usually, to go visit um, the university. And so when you go visit, like ask the other grad students, like what is your experience? Like look for, you know, the, the grad students that are women, look for the grad students of color, look for the other, for, ask about the first generation students that are there and see what their experiences are like and the support that they get in the program. Because I mean, there, there is a lot of programs that, I mean, academia is just not structured for people like that. You know, that's just not how a lot of programs are structured. Like they were structured by white men. <laughs> like that's the reality of it. Um, and, and we, like we have to, it's good to place ourselves in around people that are going to be supportive. And that was my experience at UC Merced. Um, and I feel like that's why I succeeded. I don't know what I would have, how I would have done in another program. Yeah, just, um, you know, just, I think piggybacking on that, because I don't think I can add much more to that, is that um, I think many of us feel like we're inadequate and that, that goes back to, and it's intimidating. It is an intimidating process. So we feel, yeah. You know, um, I think that feeling is real. Um, I understand it. I think we've all gone through it. But I want to say that, you know, if it's, you know, if you have 
and again, mentoring really makes a difference. So you have a good portfolio to be competitive in grad school. But, and, if, and so I would first encourage you to talk to a mentor. But then second is that you do deserve to be there. I mean, you do deserve to go for it. Mm -hmm. And I, when I work with students, I always say, you know, it's really tough to get in. Even if you're like the best student, there's no guarantee that you're gonna get into a grad program. It's, that's just real, right? I've been very fortunate that 100% of my students that I've worked with have gotten into grad school, grad school. So I'm like, I have a great record. So if you ever work with me, don't ever let me down. <laughs> but um, no, but I mean, aside from that, I think you really have to think about go for it. I mean, you have to be willing to fail in order to succeed. And just because you don't get something doesn't mean you give up. You just keep going for it. And I think that's one of the things that my family has taught me is that the really the work ethic of that we don't have the luxury of not working right. And so with Dr. Daniels and I, we think of this, I mean, I love my job, but when I was in grad school, it was work. And I think you just keep persisting and keep going at it and find folks who could also help elevate you because there are going to be days and I still have days where I'm just like, oh my gosh, like should I retire? <laughs> you know, like that's what, that, I mean, I'm at that stage. I'm like, should I take that early retirement? I think I can retire soon. I mean, there are days that you think those things, right? Because it's just like, oh, so overwhelming. It's just so much stuff. But honestly, for me, it's all of you, the students that continue to make me feel like, okay, no, I still want to be here to help support our students. Um, so feeling intimidation about going to grad school, whether you're capable or not, I think those are things that will continue to come through but with time, it gets less and less, you know, um, I would say go for it. If that's what you really, really feel like gives your purpose, go for it and come visit one of us. So there was another question I believe stood out in the group chat. Mm -hmm. uh, saying that she has been told that as, sociology, as a socially, sociology major, it will be difficult to find a stable job if you don't go to grad school. She's wondering if that holds, like if it still holds. That's really interesting. So if you'd like to talk about that, Dr. Danico and Dr. Daniel. Katie, you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, you will you can find, so what I did, <laughs> I did dental billing after I got my bachelor's. I mean, yeah, that's not in sociology, but they did like in my interview, they were like, oh, we love that you have a sociology degree. That means you're like good with, you know, you understand people. Um, dental office is a really stressful sp space because no one wants to be there. Yeah. Um, so it, my bachelor's degree, just a bachelor's degree in general helps you get jobs. Um, I mean, the reality, I think, of our economy is that good jobs, like high paying jobs, I think are hard to get. Like that's, that's the reality of like where we're at with our economy. Um, my sister, so my sister, after she graduated with her bachelor's degree with a, in sociology with a specialization in social work, she went and did AmeriCorps. And so she worked in a family resource center for two years. And then after that, she was hired by the family resource center and she became, what was it like the, like she moved up in the resource center. And so she did that for several years until she went and she just finished her MSW. Um, and so, I mean, you definitely, like you can get, for sure you can get steady employment with just a bachelor's in sociology. Um, is it going to be the job that you want? I mean, my experience was like, I wasn't happy. I, that's why I decided to go to grad school. Like I wasn't happy doing what I was doing. I wanted more. Um, I mean, different people have different experiences. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's about managing your expectations too. So can you find a job? Yes, you can find a job with sociology, you can find a job with any undergrad degree, um, you know, psychology, anthropology, anything. I mean, it's a bachelor's degree will open up some doors. But it's also about your expectation. I mean, if you're thinking, after I graduate from Cal Poly Pomona, I'm going to make 80,000 a year with a degree in sociology, that's not going to happen, right? I mean, it, it's just being real. Um, however, it could happen if you decide you want to do something different. So for example, like, pharmaceutical sales, any kind of sales industry that you can go in, you can start off making decent money, like maybe 60,000 a year, 55, 60,000 a year. But is that something that's gonna make you feel like it's your purpose? And that's the question that you have to ask yourself because after my undergrad, 
Um, my very first job was selling insurance. I sold disability and life insurance for Trans Transamerica Insurance Company. And I made good money. And in hindsight, I was pretty crazy because I went to strangers' homes and went in. I'm thinking, what was I thinking? But um, yeah, but I made very good money in two weeks. And after two weeks, I knew it wasn't for me. And they told me, if you stay, we're going to make you manager. And but I'm just like, this isn't for me. So I left. I then I tried um, applying for a lot of jobs. I got hired as a director of a preschool because I did some preschool uh, teaching as an undergrad when I was at Davis. I got hired as a director. I turned that down. They pay horribly. And I'm like, what? You want me to do all this work and you're only going to pay me this much? So I turned it down because it was principal. And then the second one I got hired one was a headhunter. I got hired as a headhunter to help other people find jobs. And I thought about it, it was decent money, but then I turned it down. I ended up after um, selling insurance, I ended up taking a minimum wage job as a behavioral modification specialist at Nutrisystem. That's how I got into Nutrisystem. I started from the bottom, but it was not my intent to move up at all. I wanted to help people. And I thought if I did behavioral modification, maybe it's like counseling, something close to what I wanna do, I did that and I couldn't live on it. So I liked what I was doing, but I couldn't make a living. So I resigned, I gave my resignation and they promoted me. At Nutrisystem, every time I resigned, they promoted me. So I got promoted like seven times, right? Within the company where I ended up becoming regional director. And then I was less, next in line to be general manager of, um, of California. And that's because sociology if you take it seriously, teaches you certain things that are so valuable, whether it's in the corporate sector, whether it's in the public sector, anywhere. It teaches you how to understand human behavior and how to interact with people. I think good sociologists, especially those of us who say like intersectionality type stuff, we have strong emotional intelligence where we are good listeners. We can also kind of assess situation and, and evaluate situations pretty well. And then also the strong writing component of our discipline makes you become like be able to communicate in writing as well. So that those are key things that people look for. Are you good with other people? Can you work in a diverse community? Can you write? If you can do those things, then you are seen as someone valuable. Immediately, are you gonna get a high paying job? No, but could you? Yeah, you could. But I would encourage you to find your purpose because like both of us, we were in jobs that it wasn't our purpose. And so, you know, what it didn't make us happy, you know, and I, it sounds kind of lame to say like, be happy, but at least find something that brings you some joy some of the time. So having the lens of um, women in sociology and grad school, um, do you think your experiences differ greatly from the experiences of your male counterparts, as in job wise, grad school, etc.? I mean, definitely, I thought this was an interesting question when you sent it over to me as like one of the possible questions, because I was thinking back to my experiences in grad school, and definitely there is differences in how men were treated and how they conducted themselves generally, like, so like on average, we're talking about on average, not everybody in my program. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of times the male grad students like wouldn't go to the events that the department would have, or they weren't doing service work. So like serving on our leadership committee, like we had a, lead, a grad student leadership committee. Um, maybe we had like one male grad student in like the six years I was there serving the leadership committee. Um, I'm not even joking. That's I think is like an accurate um, number. And so it's like sometimes the faculty, they would be like, oh, you know, we didn't have a lot of grad students at that talk. Where are you all at? Da, da 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 And it's like me and my friends who are all women, like we're like, we're at everything. Like, what are you talking about? It's these guys that are never at anything. And like, why do you keep asking us to be at stuff when we're always at stuff? Um, and so that I definitely noticed is like, I mean, that is an experience not only in grad school, but in like a lot of aspects of our lives where us as women get asked to do a lot more things than men often asked to do and so that's definitely I mean experience I had in grad school but the upside of it is that the faculty noticed and that's why I built relationships with faculty members and so I have relationships with like every single faculty member at UC Merced because I was doing all this different stuff and so you know people speak highly of me they help me get jobs like they 
they give me feedback on my work. Um, like that's, that's the upside. Like, yeah, you're getting asked to do more, but you also end up building relationships that a lot of the male faculty or the male grad students did not have those relationships. Yeah, I don't really have much more to add to that. You know, I think that's true. I think, I think we saw that in the most recent Democratic vice presidential, uh, you know, debate where there's a lot of mansplaining and, you know, for me, like white splaining. <laughs> so, you know, those, those are some of the things that happen in the academy for immigrants or, you know, for women. But I think overall, depending on the program, as Dr. Daniel said earlier, is find a program that the values um, reflects yours and that they support students like us, you know, and um, it, you're going to have a better chance, right? This, it's not perfect. The Academy is not perfect. I, my second book that I wrote is um, um, challenge um, the what, something about the ivory tower. I forgot the name of it. It's not weird. Transforming the ivory tower, uh, challenging racism, sexism, and homophobia in higher ed. Because the reality is that reality is that the higher ed the Academy is not perfect, and it's still problematic. Just it's a system of oppression that exists in higher ed as well. But if you go in with your eyes wide open, again, manage your expectation you can be successful, finding folks that will support you, you know, being able to understand how to make those kinds of connections is really important. Dr. Ocampo is on the line too. I know we only have 15 more minutes, so he can also chime in if he wants to. Oh, I agree with everything you're saying. I feel yeah. like um, what made grad school really, like the parts, it wasn't just the class part or the academic training. It was the picking people up picking up like people from the airport <laughs> or okay. attending like a coffee or or a lunch um like where they would mm -hmm. there's just so many ch you just never know when you decide to initiate a convo where it's gonna lead um yeah like dr danico we met at a conference she was sitting at a barbecue spot in austin and she was sitting behind me with a table of other colleagues. Um, and when the job at Cal Poly came up, I actually didn't even consider applying because it said quantitative sociologists and I'm generally a qual sociologist. So um, it just led to a series of events. Well, here I am. <laughs> so I, I think that grad school is useful in that way. It gives you the time and the space to have foot traffic with other people that are ambitious about whatever that is they're trying to do. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Oh, I think, you know, speaking to what he's saying too, I think that's what's great about our department and our campus too, because we do have a lot of different kinds of events that we try to host to cultivate that same kind of feeling where if you attend and if you so choose, you can also cultivate those kinds of relationships here, you know, and it's a good training ground of sorts for a grad school. So in, in all, um, how long, how many years did it take to complete your PhD program? Because I know it varies between uh, seven to 10 and, and et cetera. So how long did it take everyone? Sorry, my cat is wanting to talk to everybody. Oh, wait, um, <laughs> so for me, it took me six years. Um, I mean, I don't know when people, I hear people say, oh, it takes four years to get a PhD. Like that is not, nobody gets a PhD in four years. I had one colleague uh, in my program that did do it in four and a half years, only because he then got a, he went on the job market and got a job. Um, and then so like, he just really like rushed to get it done. Um, and the faculty did not like that he did that um, because you really have not done all your training in four years. Um, so yeah, I mean, six years is I think a really normal time to get. Your yeah, it, it took me six years as well. And I think one of someone just saying is the time commitment that scares you. Um, if you think about it, you're gonna be working for the rest of your life, right? I mean, until you can retire, but you're going to be working for a bulk of your life. School is awesome. It's such a privilege. It's such an opportunity to grow and learn more about yourself and subject matters and all that kind of stuff. That six years blink. It goes by so fast. Um, but I would say I, I don't recommend students going into PhD programs where you're not funded. 
because you should be funded for a PhD program. So, I mean, I don't know what was, do you, do you mind talking about your funding thing? Because I got five years funding and then I got an additional year afterwards. So I got support throughout my whole six years of PhD program. And, um, you know, if, if, and so I was accepted into UCLA and Riverside and I went to Hawaii because they offered me full funding. And that was the main thing. And I think, um, I think both the UCs at the time offered me four years. And so at the time I was just thinking money. I wasn't thinking about status or prestige or anything like that. And I'm so glad I went with my gut because I, let, I met my life partner here in Hawaii. You know, I think it was one of the best experiences I've had in terms of finding myself as an Asian American in Hawaii. Um, and so a lot of doors open for me, you know, um, that led me to my own professional trajectory. So sometimes people get caught up on status or certain things. I, I'm glad I didn't know. I think if, in hindsight, if I knew what I know now, I might have gone to UCLA and I think that would have been bad for me. So I'm glad I didn't. No offense to Dr. O who went to UCLA because he had a great experience there. It's just for me, I wouldn't have met my partner and have my kids. So that's the reason why. Yeah, I mean, the, really the rule of thumb is that you should not go to a PhD program unless you're getting paid to go to the PhD program. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that I remember my mom telling me that when I was like seven, I was like in high school and she's like, my boss told me that his daughter's in a PhD program and she gets paid and you, you, you get a PhD program for, you get a PhD for free and you get paid to do it. And I was like, mom, what are you talking about? That's not true. That can't be true. Like, you don't know what you're talking about, um, but it's true. So <laughs> <laughs> um, a PhD program, it is a job. Like it is. So if you're thinking about a time commitment, I mean, it's, it's six years of, you're still working. Um, mm -hmm. You're building your career, you're getting paid. So my, since UC Merced was new at the time that when they gave us our offer letter, they didn't tell us how long they're like we're gonna fund you you're good <laughs> but now they do and usually they'll tell you you have four or five years of funding and then after that you know you can teach and as a as a, an instructor and get funding but like when they offer you funding it's like you're getting this many years four or five years of funding as a teaching assistant mm -hmm. so you have to you do have to work like it's some programs do they're just like if you go to like i mean if Dr. Ocampo wants to talk about, you did your bachelor's at Stanford? I mean, sometimes like those schools, they have like, here is a fellowship where you get money just to be a PhD student. But like at the mostly at the UCs, you're working, you're, you're being a teaching assistant or a research assistant, and that's how you're getting your money. And then you can apply for fellowships. So these are like scholarships that you just get money to do your research mm -hmm. and live off of doing being a PhD student but it's a job like you're getting paid you're not I I took out some loans during my PhD but very few like less than less than 10,000 for sure um probably around five like you're not accumul accumulating debt yeah. you're making yeah. money you're living off of that money I think the thing that students don't know too is that you can actually negotiate your package so with my students who've been accepted into PhD programs, when they got their offer, um, you know, they, I always tell me, at, like, tell me what you got. <laughs> and then I would recommend, okay, negotiate that. And they're like, what, you can negotiate that? It is like a job. They really, really want you, they're gonna negotiate. So one student was able to get the first year with no teaching, just research. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and you know, there are ways to do that, but if you don't have that cultural capital, you don't know to do it, right? So that's, a, that's another advantage, again, I'm going to stress this over and over again, is talk to your faculty advisor, find someone who can really help you, because in the PhD route, you can negotiate. Some schools don't negotiate, you know, and we kind of know that, but I always say just try anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think every student that I've worked with, they've all negotiated. Um, I think like Jessica Kaiser, who's now a professor at Pitzer, I think her first two years was no teaching. Um, same with a fee who was at UCLA first two years was no teaching. I didn't do teaching for two, I didn't do TA ship for first two years either. So I think it just depends on and like how much they want you to plus how much money they have. Because when you're at a really new school at UC Merced, their funding source is kind of like they're not sure yet. But if you're at a more established school and they have like a chunk of change, then they might be able to. But with the pandemic, um, UCSB and Berkeley are not accepting students in sociology this fall. So that's what I heard. Yeah, I haven't heard about UC Merced yet. Yeah. But 
Davis is accepting and they're not requiring a GRE. <laughs> I feel like they probably aren't accepting students. No, I think Davis still is. Um, UC Irvine. Oh, I was the, I mean, UC Merced. I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, UC Irvine is accepting. So I've been contacting admissions people and asking, are you guys accepting? Are you guys accepting? So I can, and the students are also telling me, you know, whether they're being um, accepted or not. Yeah. Anything uh, else, um, Daniela, Brianna, Victoria, in the chat sphere or things that you want? Or if anyone wants to unmute and Yes, Anthony, the power of negotiation, you know me. And then also like communities of color and women just don't historically negotiate. So that's something that I do. Some of you know that I coach people. And so I always talk about negotiation. You have to negotiate. They can always say no, but you got to go for it, right? I have a question. Hi. Oh. Hi, what's your name? Daniela. Hi, Daniela. Hi, how are you? Uh, for grad school, like for, for me right now, I'm just wondering for like how much is it, but uh what's the advice you guys give like um for like funding like scholarships like financing wisely for grad school well so like we said if you're going to a phd program you shouldn't be paying anything for grad school um that's that's how most phd programs work so you're not you don't pay tuition it's all covered as part of your package that you receive. Like if, if, if you are paying for a PhD program, that's probably not the program you want to go to. Daniela, should, what program were you thinking about? Uh, Would, for master's, just a master's degree, <laughs> yeah. Master's in? Um, social work or, um, or higher education, but I'm going most towards to a higher education. Okay, so, you know, uh, we have some really great CSU uh, programs, like CSU Long Beach, higher ed program is really great. Their social work program is also very, very good. Um, the MA programs do not offer funding. So you do have to pay out of pocket. Some of them do also accept financial aid. So you have to contact their grad program and just ask about funding structure and scholarship. So I think for the CSU, some of them do, like in the UCs as well, like one of my students who went to MSW at UCLA, she got financial aid. So you just have to ask their admissions coordinators how it works. Um, I've had students for MSW who've gone to CSUs, UCs, and USC. USC is very expensive. And so you have to kind of think about return on the investment. Um, any of the private schools are very expensive, like Azusa Pacific is very expensive. Um, I think they just got some kind of funding where they get, they're giving away scholarships. Um, I personally, I don't know how any of you feel about this, but I personally don't write letters of support for Azusa Pacific still. Um, because their student conduct code um, discriminates, discriminates against LGBTQ community. So because of that, I don't write letters, just uh, my own personal thing. But I write letters for all the other schools as long as they don't have anything written that discriminates against students, um, you know, identities, right, and who they are. So, um, but they do have, I heard that they do have scholarship. And some of my really great students do go to Azusa Pacific, you know, and even without me writing letters direct, they still go. So, um, you just have to kind of investigate because every school is different, but mm -hmm. MA programs do not fund you. With the exception, I heard Urbana, Illinois, Champaign, um, University of Illinois Champaign at Urbana, I think their MSW program did have scholarship. And that was the only one that I've ever heard of because my student applied there and she was offered a scholarship. So um, that's the only one that I've heard of. Well, there's also two. So my sister, when she got her, her social work, her master's in social work, she applied to the Title IV-E program through the state of California, and that funded her MSW. Right, tell so, them about that, Katie, what that is. Yeah, so, I mean, my understanding is, is it's a program, you apply to it, um, and you have, to, you have to work in certain jobs afterwards. And so that's kind of how, like, that's your commitment. So, like, right, she just got a job um, working for CPS. And so yeah. you're working in, in a state program like in a state job and that's for so long. And that's, I mean, if anyone else wants to add to that, if they, if they know about Title IV-E. Um, yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. They have to work for a state or county um, and mm -hmm. it's usually CFS. And so um, we can talk about that later and the pros and cons of that, but they do fund you and it's a small sacrifice to work there. I think it's like three years, right, afterwards? Yeah, it's not a long time. It's not a long time. And then, mm -hmm. you know, they will support you. Um, I've had a former student who actually joined the military because the military paid for their higher education. And now he's a psychologist here in Hawaii. So when um, he was a psych major and he's now a psychologist, he got his um, 
PsyD at um, Laverne. And so um, he thinks it's really expensive, but yeah. But you know, he got it all paid for because of the VA. Mm -hmm. And I yes, have a question. Oh, I'm, um, sorry. I'm sorry, thank you for information. I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on uh, degrees online right now versus going to an institution? Well, you're getting a degree online. Just kidding. <laughs> All right, not really, right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that's what I hear in the students, like, um, you know, like the students who are kind of venting about Cal Poly, you know, like they're saying it's kind of like online. <laughs> so um, I don't know. What Do you want to take that, Katie? I mean, so I wouldn't maybe not think of schools as online versus not online, but as like, are they for profit or not for profit? And so that's actually where the line of like schools that are for profit, um, they tend to be less reputable and you're not getting the same quality of education. I mean, it, and it also depends like what you wanna do with your degree. Like if you're just getting your degree, your, your master's so that you get bumped up in your pay scale, like people do that, you know, teachers do that a lot. And you just wanna do the online program, all you need is the degree. Then maybe you do wanna go to that for profit school that offers a degree online. I mean, there's not-for-profit schools that offer online programs and maybe you should, I would go in that direction if that's all you, if you want an online program. Um, it just depends what you wanna do, I guess, with your, but just know like these for-profit schools tend to not be as prestigious. You're not getting the same quality of education. And, and they're, you know, they've been caught for like predatory lending practices and mm -hmm. things like that. But you know, like USC has a total online MSW program. I think the end too, aside from everything that Dr. Daniel said, which I completely agree with, is that whether online learning is a good format for you. And in light of everything that we talked about in terms of building relationship, making those connections, as you know, right now in our remote learning, people are doing it. Like the students who come in to my office hours and talk to me, I know who they are. I mean, I know like they have kids, you know, I know like they're, one of the people who are here is really into backpacks, you know, like I know, I know those kinds of things because they, come and visit me during the hours. Um, so it's it's more possible, but it is, there is more of a, it's a business, right? The online education that are just for totally online is, is a total business, they churn people in and out, right? Um, and even with the ones like SC that have online, some of the students do say that um, they like, they go through it for a year and then they opt to like change to face-to-face -face because at USC, because they find it that they don't get to know their professors, they don't build relationships and they feel like they're kind of missing out. So, but like Dr. Daniel says, it really depends on why you want that. If, if, if it is indeed, that's why you're asking the question um, and whether it's a good learning format for you because I'm, I couldn't learn that well in an online format because um, I'm not that organized. <laughs> No, and I agree with you in that, in that, but like to your point, now with this pandemic and how we're students online, it kind of changes the, you know, the, um, the options, if you will, because I would have never considered online um, master's in social work um, degree. But now how, you know, we are in the pace that we are today, it's like, oh, well, it's, I'm, you know, we're making it work, but because of, you know, professors that are being very gracious and uh, they're in somehow, you know, being accommodating to us students, but is, that, is it going to be the same thing for a master's in social work program? I don't know. Those are the kinds of questions that I have. And, and you talked about, um, you know, programs that will fund you. Like, are there, is there such a thing with online programs, like to be funded or that only, it, it, it doesn't, that culture doesn't exist in, with those kind of um, programs? Yeah, and oftentimes the online programs, they are coming from for-profit colleges. Yeah. I mean, there is, I mean, a handful, I think of, there are, are universities that aren't for-profit that offer online degrees, but a lot of times they are for-profit and so they're not gonna fund you, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, and I think also, um, I keep wanting to, um, who is the person, oh, Sandra. I keep wanting to call you Sylvia because I knew a Sylvia Zuniga. So I'm like, are you related to Sylvia? <laughs> but, um, I think the, the reality is that we're normally not an online school. And so all of us try to create a, a space and a learning environment that's still conducive to regular types of learning. So even if we're teaching asynchronous, we offer discussions face to face. We try to create face to face opportunities as much as possible. Um, and none of us like this online. And I think that's the difference, right? So we're trying to create opportunities for quote unquote normal type of environment versus the online format is just that's their mission 
And as Dr. Daniel says, it is really for profit. You know, they want to get you in, they want to get you out. And if you're going in for something like an MSW, I mean, you're, you're, look, you're getting that degree to start a career in social work or progress your career in social work. And so you want connections. I mean, that's one of the ways my sister got her job is through her connections from her program. And so if you're not making those connections, that's limiting your job opportunities, potentially. So it's just something to think about. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question, Sandra. Are you related to Sylvia? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> no, no relation to Sylvia, sorry. <laughs> I don't see a lot of Zunigas, and I'm like, hey, I know a Zuniga. <laughs> Any other? Questions? I have a personal question. Um, how how do you when knowing now that you have children and stuff? How do did you balance out going to school and having the children? Since women have more pressure on themselves because if they have kids, then they might not get the job or feel like they have to wait to finish school. How are you able to balance that, especially if you didn't have kids at, at a younger age? Mm -hmm. So I didn't have, I don't have children, um, but one of my really close friends from grad school who I still, we still have Zoom writing hours every week now after I've graduated, she's still there. Um, she actually had a baby in her, was it her first or no, we were in our second year. We were, we came into a cohort. So she had a baby in her second year. Yeah. Of grad school. Um, and so I think another thing with that is going into a program that's supportive. I have another another friend actually from grad school who did come in with a a, a kid who she was a single mom. Um, she came in she's a single mom into a PhD program in public health, um, and I think it's just like having looking for programs that are supportive of parents um, that don't have this culture. So a lot of grad programs especially PhD programs have this culture of like you have to work 60 70 hours in a week to be successful so look for programs that don't have that philosophy look for departments that they're like no we want you to have a work-life balance we support that work-life balance and that's more conducive to having having children's being a parent and I think um, you know I saw a number of people be successful at UC Merced and PhD programs while being parents even single parents because they were in a more supportive environment. I'm not saying that there's not a lot of challenges that come with that. There is, but you can do it for sure. Yeah, I, I don't think it's that different than our awesome students who are parent students now at Cal Poly Pomona, right? Is that there's definitely a, you know more to adjust to and more to attend to when you have children. Um, but I think in grad, I didn't have kids in grad school. I had after, I'm, I'm a total planner, so I kind of, my children were all planned and they came out exactly when I wanted them to. So, um, cause you know, I have to plan and I'm like, okay, they're gonna come out right when I'm gonna get tenure and they're gonna get out when, right when my first book's gonna come out. So I'm not gonna be stressed. Um, so I made my partner wait for a long time because you know, they wanted to have kids right away. I'm like, gotta wait. Uh, but I did have friends in grad school who did have children in grad school. And what they told me was, cause I asked, I said, isn't it kind of tough because they said grad school and academia offers a lot of flexibility of time. The beauty mm -hmm. of being a professor is that we get to kind of, in most cases, control our time. I mean, there are certain days that you have to teach, right? But everything else is kind of on your own time, right? So we have a little bit more flexibility that, you know, I was, my daughter went to Montessori right by Mount Sac, and I was able to drive up there and have, you know, breastfeed her there or, you know, I can go over there and see her doing her little school events and come back um, because my job was much more flexible, you know, than my partners. So, and then in grad school too, they're saying they thought it was the best time because they didn't have a quote unquote real job. You know, they did have a job because they're TAing or they're doing research or they're doing, um, trying to finish up their PhD, but they felt that it offered them that flexibility. I think it depends on your support system too. My partner's very supportive. Um, so even when you are a professor, as a junior professor, when I had a baby, people would, people do discriminate against you when you have children still. It's gotten much better. I made sure that it's better in our department for sure, because I'm, I was the first woman hired in our department. But um, people would say things like, oh, you know, have you looked into this thing that you can apply for? And they're like, oh, wait, you have a kid. It'll be hard for you to go. 
you know, they would make these kinds of very microaggression and sometimes macroaggression kinds of comments against, um, you know, women in the academy that have children. Or, you know, I would have my breast pump, you know, thing machine and I would be at work and they're like, hey, who's watching your kid? You know, and I said, what are you talking about? She's right here. <laughs> you know, like, and I show a picture of her. Um, so they would make these kinds of comments versus like my partner who, who's, um, who's a cisgender male, you know, when he's with the kids alone and I'm at a conference, they would say, wow, you are so, such a, like, you're such a great dad, you know, you're watching your kid. And they would tell me, you're so lucky you have him to watch your kids. Right. So there's all these sexist, misogynistic um, culture around the academy and in general public, but it's getting better. And I think that you can do it. It's not easy. It's a little bit more tough for sure. But hey, moms are like the toughest things out there. So I think our parent um, students here are can multitask to the best of them. And if you, if you have children, you can definitely do it in grad school, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I think we're over time. I mean, definitely if you, I know there's so many more questions in the chat that we didn't get to answer. So for sure, you know, if you want to chat with me, I'm sure Dr. Danico feels the same way, like reach out to us. Like we would love to continue this conversation. And I can stay on for a little bit if some of you, some of you want to just kind of talk, just kind of like yeah. if we're in a public space, you know, we would be standing and talking to you afterwards. So mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to do that. Or you're also free to leave. It's up to you. Yeah, I'll stay on as well. Yeah. I just wanted to I thank. Of, oh. oh, sorry. Did you want to speak? Yeah, I just wanted to. I had a, a quick question, but if you wanted to say something, go ahead. You could go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Um, I know this might be a silly question. I, I put it in the comments. Um, but if I'm thinking about um, master's or, or my PhD, so after getting my bachelor's degree, am I able to go straight into a PhD program or do I need to earn my master's degree first? You can go straight in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. People do, people do get their master's sometimes before they go to PhD programs, but that doesn't mean your PhD program will take less time. Like it doesn't mean, oh, I have my master's already, PhD program, I'm gonna go through quick. That's not true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, I did not have a master's degree. I went straight, well, bachelor's, worked for three years, then PhD program. You get your master's along the way in most programs. Yeah, master's. Oh. Also, yeah. So both of us are master's, but we didn't go in for the master's program. We just got it en route, en route to our PhD. Ooh, I'm gonna tell you all a secret. Hopefully I don't get in trouble for this. Um, so technically, I love to spill the tea, you guys. Um, technically, you can master out of PhD programs also. Yeah. So if your PA, as long as your program offers a master's on the way that is not conditional upon completing the PhD program, you can go to a PhD program that is funded. And once you get your master's, you can leave. Uh, P, I mean, people are honest. Some people are honest about this. Like this is something you can do. So it's yeah. just something to think about. Like if you don't want to pay for a master's degree and uh, get into a PhD program. And then if you're done with your, when you have your master's, you can leave. Like you don't have to stay and get your PhD. That's can you go longer? Like bad. Is it bad? It's, it's your life. Like do you, <laughs> you know, like what, who are you? I mean, they, at UC Moore said they told us that they told us that's something you can do. Um, they did not want to try to force us to be there. And people did it. And no, no one looked at them poorly. Mm -hmm. um, I, have, I have a paper that I just published with a faculty member and multiple grad students and one of them did master out and we kept her, we never like took her off the paper or anything like that. She's, she just got published. Um, and you know, three years after she stopped going to grad school. So no, I mean, depending on your program, some people maybe, maybe could be mad about it, but you'll never see them again. Like you're, if, you're not trying to be in academia. <laughs> I mean, if you are, you can never see them again. No, I didn't get mad at people who, there, there are different reasons why some people may master out. You know, some people may get their master's en route and just, they're just exhausted, you know, and they just are done with it. Or they're, maybe they don't like their dissertation committee or whatever, and they want to end it. Other people may feel like, hey, you know, PhD wasn't all that that I wanted to do, and I don't want to really be a professor at a four-year institution anymore, and so I'm going to master out. There are a lot of different reasons. I have folks who went through my program who mastered out and they teach at community colleges here in Hawaii. 
And so there are, you know, there are different options, right? It's more competitive. It's harder to get a job at a community college actually nowadays than at a four-year institution. But um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. And I didn't think anything less of them. I just wanted to make sure that they were okay, you know, like when they mastered out, like, um, but yeah, if that was a choice, it's your life. And you don't know, like, you don't need to talk about it. If that's something you want to do. You don't know that you are going to not stay in the program. You might do your two years and get a master's and be like, well, I'm here already. Like, I might as well do another three, four years. Like, why not? Yeah. You know, so you don't, you actually don't, even if you're like, well, maybe I'll just master out. Like, I'm, that's what I want to do. You really don't know that. So you don't know. You're, you're going to a PhD program. So if you decide to take that route, for example, after you get your BA and decide, you know what, I'm just going to go for my PhD, do you go longer? I mean, is it more years since you're doing that route? Yeah, PhD is roughly, you know, six to 10 years, depending on how long it takes. It took both of us six years. Yeah. And I, in my experience, anyone that came in with a master's degree, it still took them just as long as anybody else. Like it's, you know, maybe they had to take a few less classes, but it's not really dependent on your classes. A lot of your program, you're not even taking classes. Like you're done with classes after, I mean, my, with my pro, like third year, you're done with all your classes. And so it's really just how long it takes you to do your research and it, everybody, it takes a long time. So it doesn't matter that you came in with a master's degree. Like everybody, it still takes about similar time span. It does, yeah. I just wanted to thank you all for um, this wonderful talk. It was so, so insightful. And I felt like I'm sitting amongst friends. Obviously, I have so much respect for you guys and your respective fields. But I'm, it was so empowering and beautiful. So thank you for that. And I wanted to ask, even though I have not had the honor to have you both as a professor, would I still be able to come for advice or anything? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I see yeah, a lot of students who aren't my students. <laughs> because I feel like this was so needed and it further motivated me. So thank you. Yeah, I would love to chat with any of you all. Like thank definitely you. come email me. We could set up a time. I could tell you what my office hours are. For sure. Thank and you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. And I really appreciate that you especially have been coming to all of the different sessions. So it's been great to see you there. I always support. Honestly, I appreciate this so much because during this pandemic, it's difficult to remain in contact with especially faculty friends. So I feel like more connected this way. It's so, so important. And like I gained so much insight and I see all these lovely faces. So it's been wonderful. Dalia, so, we're friends on Twitter too, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's so awesome to finally talk to you. And um, I hope to take a course with both of you someday soon, or at least get to know you more. But um, thank you again. And I'll definitely be attending all the events. Mm -hmm. So take care. Awesome. Professor Daniels, um, this is Jennifer. Um, hi. hi. You know how you were talking about the Title E? So if you already work for the government, you still need to put in those three years for that program, it's or how does that work? It's a program, like, you have to actually, like, apply for the program. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, if you want to just, like, Google Title IV E, um, Social Work California, you have to, it's a program you apply for, and they okay. look at applicants. The fact that you have experience already, I mean, that was, I think, one of the reasons my sister got into the program, like, she had some experience in social work. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, but yeah, so look it up. It's a program you apply for um, while at the same time you're applying to grad program. Yeah, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you apply and then once you receive an email, if you got accepted, and if you got accepted, then they will pay for your two years of master's degree. And then after that, you have to work for them after two years. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they help place you in jobs. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Awesome. What's the name of that program again? It's Title IV E. Oh, Title IV E. Yeah. Thank you. I had one more question before we leave. Um, is there a specific program um, or like a, a section of social work that you would advise going into for your PhD? 
Wait, Wait social there. work or social sociology? Oh, well, either social work or sociology, or even because I, I have kind of been toying with the idea of psychology or um, like um, child education. Is there is there something that you either of you believe is more important or would be kind of a better program to go into to land uh, a good career? So, I mean, something to keep in mind is a PhD program is a re you're getting a degree in research. Um, so if you don't want to do research, a PhD yeah. program is not probably what is for you. Um, and so, I mean, that I think would be something to think about if like, do you want to math? If you, if you don't really have that much of an interest in research, you know, go for the master's. If, if you want a career in research, whether that's in academia, academia or in the private sector or for the government doing research, a PhD would be a good path to go in terms of um, like whether you want to do psychology, sociology, um, I mean social work, that it just depends on what interests you and what you want for your career. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, Marissa, there, there are people from psych students who also go to MSW and so students who also go to MSW, you know, like in terms of that's more like for practice, right? If you want to actually go in the field and work with, let's say in your case, children, if that's what you wanted to do. So, um, and then as Dr. Daniels mentioned that the PhD is really for research. Um, so you have to kind of figure out what you are really intentional about, like at this, because your interests can change, right? But, but right now, like, do you want to be practice oriented where you're working with clients and working with, you know, folks? Or do you want to be doing like research and maybe possibly doing at a think tank or being at a university? So it just depends on where like your passion points are and where you feel like you find most fulfillment. And if you don't know the answer to that, I mean, again, you don't need to go straight into yeah. uh, grad program. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you all another story. Um, I actually went into a master's program right after my bachelor's. And I dropped out of it two days into it. Um, so I just felt like this is not what I want. I don't want, it was in English. I was an English and social double major. I was like, I don't care about this anymore. Like I care about these larger social issues. I want to, I, I want to work. I need to work. <laughs> like I want to, that's what I want to do right now. I don't want to be in a master's program. And so it really wasn't what I wanted. I just felt like that's what I needed to do you know, having those thoughts in my head of like, what am I going to do with my life? I did, I had this idea that I wanted to teach. I, at that time, I was like, I want to get a master's and teach at a community college. Um, but then I was like, this is just not what I want to do right now. And so if you don't know what you want to do, I think that's the biggest, why you shouldn't go to a grad program yeah. is because you're just doing it because you don't know what else to do. Because yeah. then your heart's not in it. Your heart needs to be in it. And so then just go find a job and work and learn what you like and what you don't like. And that's what led me to then applying to PhD programs. Like I would never, again, I did not want to be in a PhD program when I was an uh, undergrad. I thought I could never, I would say that I could never be in a PhD. I could never go and get my PhD. And it wasn't until I worked and I felt, built up my self-esteem and my self-efficacy. And then I was like, I want a lot of control over the things I, I do. I want to have an impact in the world. I want to do research. I want to teach. This all fits into going into a PhD program, becoming a professor. And so it was like through those experiences of working and hating my job and finding out that I'm actually smart and a hard worker <laughs> and I can do this is like, that's what led me down this path. And so like, it's okay to give your space to, yourself space in life to figure those things out. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Thank and you guys so much. In, in addition to work though, too, you know, as I think um, Dr. Daniels pointed out, like AmeriCorps, there's also, you know, research, even you can even like, I think one of our former students who was a PM, they, she ended up going to Stanford and becoming a research assistant there. You know, so the, the notion of work is very broad. You can do nonprofit work, you know, you can do international work. You know, there's a lot of different kinds of opportunities. Again, it depends on where it takes you. One of my students, um, she now has an MSW, but she took some time off and she ended up teaching English in Korea. And she was there for five years. She took a class with me and fell in love with Korea, Latina. And she moved to Korea. And every time I saw, when I went back, I would see her. And she's like, I have a Korean boyfriend now. And then it only lasted like a month because they couldn't talk. <laughs> so, but I mean, I think if you're willing to take, if you have, if you can, like some people can't, right? Just speak up. Um, but try stuff, you know, like go for it because 
it's okay. Like you've heard our stories. We've tried lots of different things. Yeah, I dropped out of a program. Like, yeah. I straight up just dropped out and then went on and got my PhD in degree. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your stories and your insight. Thanks for coming, Marissa. All right. Uh, I think this Welcome to one of, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to, um, you know, give everybody a thank you for sharing um, all the information, um, great knowledge for, for me. And um, I just want to say thank you and um, have a great night. Thank you, Dr. Danico. Thanks, Dolores. Thank you for being here. Okay, so I think this concludes everything. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Domingo. Sure. Stop recording. <laughs>